actually going to introduce herself. Um, feel free to type in any questions. I will be monitoring the chat and I'll ask um, Lori uh, either during or at the end, depending on what you ask. So I'll hand it off to Lori. Thank you, Cinnamon. And uh, sorry you're not here to enjoy the regular two dozen donuts or uh, cookies <laughs> that Cinnamon and I have been eating. <laughs> Just joking. Uh, so my name is Lori Whitecamp. I am a fisheries biologist specializing in salmon, uh, working for the North NOAA Fisheries Northwest Fisheries Science Center. Uh, I've worked there since 1992, spent the first part of my career with the Northwest Center at Seattle, and then I moved down here to Newport in 2004. And this talk really originates from kind of this major change in the focus of my research that started two years, almost exactly two years ago, when I got a call to invite me to go on a winter cruise out in the Gulf of Alaska. And in fact, exactly a year ago today, I was driving home from Vancouver, having spent a month on a Russian research ship, going, wow, what a trip that was. And so a lot of the focus, normally I work on salmon in the ocean, but in the near shore and in estuaries. Uh, and so slowly my focus is really changing to the high seas, the, and which is the topic of today's speech or talk, I should say. So what I want to do is talk about the past, what is known about the uh, winter ecology of salmon on the high seas and, and the historical research that, that allows us to know what was going on. And the present, obviously I came up with this title a little while ago because uh, I'm going to be talking about a cruise that happened last year as the present. Um, why we did it, what we did, and what we found, including some new results. And then talk about the future, a cruise that's actually going on right now and another one planned for next year and end with some conclusions. So, past. Um, I think the bottom line is that we really do not know very much at all about salmon on the high seas, especially during winter. Of all the different phases of the salmon life cycle, this is the poorest understood. We don't know where the fish are out in the ocean or why they're distributed as they are. We don't know what is available for them to eat or what they're eating or potential competitors that are going on as well as predators out there. And it may be a really critical period. So Connie Macon and Dick Beamish published a paper in 2001 that said that the winter, ocean winter period may be a critical, uh, second critical period in the marine environment for the survival of salmon. So their hypothesis said that during the first summer in the ocean, it's really important to escape, to grow rapidly to escape predation. So there's size selective predation. So that's the first critical period. But then in the first winter, only the fish with really high energy reserves that they accumulated during the first summer are the ones that survive. So the small fish get die or get eaten, and presumably there's some kind of predation event going on. And really the big question is, is this actually true or not? I think they sat down with a good bottle of whiskey and came up with this, uh, but it's really, there's been very little direct evidence to tell whether this is, this is true or not. Um, Kate Myers and company back in 2016 published a paper uh, which I've got the title page here, which really describes what we know about salmon in the ocean uh, based on many years of study, and then also, more importantly, what we should know about salmon in the ocean. And I'd like to uh, present a couple things from that paper. One is that this is where high seas winter research occurred. And you can see in the eastern Pacific on the right side there was a lot of research by Canada, which is abbreviated CA in the 60s, as well as by the US. Um, the Russians did a little in the late 80s, and then the Japanese and Canadians uh, did some work in the 90s, and uh, Japanese were last there in 2006. But since then, nobody has really been out uh, during the winter to look and see what's going on. And I will sh be showing you some data from this Canadian survey in 62 to 65, as well as the 2006 to compare to more recent. But basically, uh, that's not a lot of coverage for 
salmon in the ocean, uh, not a lot of surveys. And, and mainly because it's really expensive to go out there and often the weather is horrible and you can't work very well. So there's a good reason why it hasn't been addressed very well. So from the Myers et al. paper, they reached this conclusion as to what affects the winter distribution of salmon. So you can see there's top down and bottom up processes on the top as well as environmental uh, variation. So things like temperature preferences or certain water masses that, that cause salmon to distribute where they are, as well as kind of phenotypic plasticity and population dynamics as well as the heredity at the bottom. And I think the easiest way to sum this up is that it's complicated and there's not really any one thing that anybody has found that causes salmon to distribute as they do. So what do we know about Northwest salmon? This is just showing high seas distributions, not necessarily winter distributions for our main salmon species, Chinook, Coho, Sockeye Chum, and Steelhead. And I want to point out that Coho on the top right, we mainly thought they're a coastal species, and, but there occasionally are some caught out on the high seas. And then steelhead actually have the uh, widest ranging distribution of any of the Northwest salmon. We think they actually go all the way across the Kamchatka and back during their year or two out in the ocean. Um, but the, the kind of the details of all this are very, very poorly understood. And these are really uh, rough ideas of where the fish are. And I think it's really important that if you want to understand how ocean condi conditions are going to affect salmon, things like the blob or other events that go on there, the very first step is knowing where your salmon are so that you can then know what conditions they're experiencing. So this distribution on the high seas is, is really, really important to understanding um, the whole ecology of what's going on. Uh, the Japanese have spent a lot of time understanding the movements of salmon, not just where they're distributed, but how they're distributed over time. And this is an example from a, uh, the chapter on chump salmon from the Dick Beamish's book on uh, ocean ecology of Pacific salmon, showing that fish originate in Japan over on the far left bottom, left side. They go up into the Oskosk Sea during their first summer and fall, then off Kamchatka, and then up into the Bering Sea during their first summer, and then they move back and forth between the Bering Sea in the summer and the Gulf of Alaska in the winter until they eventually go back home to Japan. By contrast, this is just an example of pink salmon ocean distributions. Um, we kind of know that there seems to be this western boundary of North American stocks and an eastern boundary of Asian stocks, and there's some little arrows in there that kind of depict fish moving around, but really the details are very poorly understood for everything except uh, Japanese chum salmon as to exactly where they're moving. OK, the present. So I uh, was fortunate to get invited to participate in this International Gulf of Alaska expedition last year. Uh, it took place on the ship, the Professor Kaganovsky. Uh, I was not alone. We had a whole scientific crew. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm the one sitting down on the wet net getting my butt soaked uh, while we took pictures. Uh, this is the very first day. We were all kind of wondering what on earth we've gotten ourselves into. Um, and as I state there, there were actually there were 21 of us, I believe, on the science crew and another 31 crew members and officers on board this ship. So 52 people on a 180-foot ship, uh, which has actually worked, worked out OK. So the reason for this cruise was Dick Beamish. For those of you who don't know him, Dick uh, is an emeritus uh, guy from, I should say guy, fisheries researcher with Fish and Oceans Canada. He was a director of the Pacific Biological Station in Nanaimo for many years. And he really recognized this long, uh, long recognized need to study salmon in the ocean. And he arranged, personally, the charter of a Russian vessel raised $1.3 million from the various uh, entities and organizations, and then selected a science team based on their abilities and making sure we had uh, international participation. And I was lucky enough to be one of the people who got invited to go and, and was willing to go. I should say that I had no fewer than four people tell me that I was absolutely nuts to go out on this because of the time of year 
the ship and the length of time, which was uh, 30 days on this Russian research vessel. And this cruise has since become the uh, flagship of the International Year of the Salmon, which is actually not a year. It's a multi-year of the salmon, so which is continuing. So they, this is the study area. Uh, this is in the Gulf of Alaska. Each of those points is a station we were able to sample. And I just sketched in the EEZs, the exclusive ex economic zones for the US and Canada. So we had a couple uh, stations that were up within the US EEZ. We were, I think, ended up about 150 miles from Kodiak, is the closest to shore we got. Um, and we had these objectives. One was to uh, look at the dis distributions of salmon in winter in the Gulf of Alaska, and particularly not just the species distributions, but as well the stock distributions, uh, conduct the first abundance estimates of salmon in the Gulf of Alaska, document the health and condition of salmon, and then test these key hypotheses regulating salmon. The winter bottleneck that I described, the part of the critical size, critical period, uh, whether there are temperature-based distributions and potential competition between species. So uh, this is the track that we then made. We started and ended in Vancouver. Uh, our stations were about 60 nautical miles apart. I should say we basically were able to cover a 10 degree latitude by 10 degree longitude grid. Uh, if the weather was good, it would take us between six and eight hours of travel time uh, and a lot longer when the weather was bad. And luckily, uh, we had really, really good weather throughout most of the cruise. Um, and at every station, we did three things. One was physical and chemical oceanography, uh, second, biological oceanography, and then third, fish. And I'm really not going to talk about the physical, chemical, or biological oceanography, but I have some slides if somebody wants to see them later. So the fish team, uh, there were 12 of us, I believe, uh, that represented three nations, uh, Russia, Canada, US, and Japan. And then Vladimir uh, was representing the North Pacific Anatomist Fish Commission, which is kind of how they funneled the whole project through. So uh, good good crew. Uh, this is the rope crawl. We towed this rope crawl. The mouth opening is about 40 meters wide by 30 meters deep, uh, towed for an hour at a time near surface. So it wasn't right at the surface. It was a little bit below. But uh, this is a really fascinating net in the sense that there wasn't a lot of fancy uh, twine or rope that it was made out of. As far as I can tell, it was primarily, I don't know if it's cotton or sisal or what, uh, but a natural fiber net. And they were constantly working on it and keeping it in good shape. Uh, once we brought the net back on board, everything was counted, identified, and measured. Uh, I'll show you some little bit of data on the, these are kind of our main species, or, or uh, bycatch, I should say. So we got a lot of these um, boreal clubhook squid, uh, lanternfish, mctophids, and then chrysaeora jellyfish as well. For salmon, uh, we took a lot of different samples at sea from everything, excuse me, all salmon. Uh, so we took stomachs to look at the diets, and, and Anton actually did the diets on board. We took fin clips for genetics, otoliths to look at growth, scales for age, and then muscle to look both for lipid levels, so as an assessment of energy storage, as well as trophic biomarkers to be able to construct an entire food web of, of what was out there. And there's some nice pictures of dissecting fish and uh, some fin clips. Uh, empty chum salmon stomachs. And then we, for ag every set, up to 10 fish, uh, we processed them, especially for these fish health uh, samples that Christy Miller at the Department of Fish and Oceans in Canada is running. So a whole bunch of tissues. And these were really slow to take. I think it took about 20 or 25 minutes to process a fish uh, for these. And that's Christoph Dieg in the red hat, uh, who's a postdoc at uh, DFO that, that was in charge of this, and then Albina, who's one of the Russians, uh, who caught on quickly on how to process fish. So, and as Chris is showing there, Chris Neville uh, holding up the carcass, there wasn't a whole lot left after we were done with them, especially after we took the fillets off the sockeye, uh, which this is one of those, and, and 
consequently ate them in various forms, and they were really, really good. So, okay, results. Uh, I'm going to talk, show you a little bit of the physical oceanography, and then these non-salmonids, and then talk about salmon. And for those of you who have seen some version of this talk before, uh, we've got some new parts, so comparisons to previous research, as well as the origins of chum, sockeye, and coho, which is really cool. Uh, and I should mention, you'll see, and you saw in those photographs, all the salmon got these yellow floy tags. So each carcass got, or each fish got assigned a unique number, and then we put it on the fish on the carcass, and so that if you had to go back and sample again, you knew which fish it was, because with hundreds of salmon on board, it gets really crazy really quick. Uh, or I should say hundreds of salmon in the freezer on board this ship. Okay, so this is showing the temperature and salinity across the study area. You can see in the south, it's warm and uh, not as salty, and further north, it's colder and saltier. And this really reflects the current structure going uh, through the area. So across the bottom, we have the east flowing uh, west wind drift current, and then across the top of the study area is the west flowing uh, Alaska jar. So, and the uh, chemical signatures indicate that these are definitely distinct bodies of water. We also had a mixed depth layer, so the top 100 meters of the water column was thoroughly mixed, which is pretty impressive to see uh, that, that deep of mixing. So this is the distribution of the hook arm squids on the left and the lantern fishes on the right across the study area. Basically, any time we put the net in the water at night, we got both of these two critters. What is really unusual is that the lantern fish were represented by almost exclusively by one species or dominated by one species, these blue lantern fish, Tarleton bedia, uh, which are the big blue circles there, which uh, according to Vladimir, who's an expert on Lanternfishes is really unusual to have it, uh, the lanternfish community dominated by a single species like that. Uh, a couple other cool things we got, uh, this big one that looks like a dinosaur or a pterodactyl uh, is a dagger tooth that are really, really impressive if you look very closely, but if you walk away, you realize they're actually really fragile and relatively small. Um, but apparently they can do a lot of damage to other fishes, including salmon. We also got some uh, deep sea squid that we did never caught in our net, but we did get them in the stomachs of both dogfish and uh, Chinook salmon. And then at the bottom is a transparent eel, and I highlighted the head there so you can see the little eyeball uh, and mouth on that. And this thing was about a foot long and just super clear and gelatinous. I've always seen them in the fish books, the larval fish books, and thought, God, that'd be cool to see one, and we did. So that was that was nice. I was hoping for some other really cool stuff out there. And, was a little disappointed, but oh well, such is life. Okay, so looking at salmon catches, um, this is the distribution of all salmon combined across the study area. So we were able to catch at least one fish in 85% of the sets, which we were quite happy with. And if you parse that out by species, uh, those are shown here. So chum salmon was our most abundant species. Uh, we caught 222 of those, followed by coho uh, at 94, sockeye 73, only caught 31 chum, and, or excuse me, pink salmon, and then three uh, chinook salmon. And I think it's really interesting, given these catches, uh, that uh, I'd always thought that coho were a coastal species, and in other studies that have been out on the high seas, they're usually a pretty minor species, but here they were our second most abundant species. So I, it was really interesting to see uh, what, how abundant they were, and, and it will be interesting uh, to see what they're catching now with the a cruise that's going on right as we speak. Um, another interesting thing is pinks are the most abundant species of salmon across the Northeast Pacific. Uh, they're three to four times more abundant than any other species, yet we hardly caught any of them. Uh, and they were all down in the very southern end of our uh, study area. So where were they? Uh, maybe they were, if we kept going south, we would have caught more, but who knows? Uh, it was really surprising, uh, how, given how abundant they are, that we caught so few of them. And then finally, uh, some people are really surprised that we only caught three Chinook, but I think that's actually expected. 
Um, Chinook are the least abundant of any of the Pacific salmon, and they also have the deepest distribution in the water column. So I think if there may have been some individuals below our net that we never caught, um, but they're, they're relatively uh, un, unabundant. What's the word for that? Um, compared to the rare, thank you. Uh, they're relatively rare compared to the other salmon species. So I think it's, uh, we should have expected to get three, and uh, there's no, no big surprise there. Uh, if you look at where we caught these fish, especially the, the three most abundant chums, coho and sockeye, you can see that both chum and coho were being at the southern part of the study area were also in the warmer waters, whereas sockeye were mainly caught up north where it was much cooler. So we see some uh, pretty dramatic temperature differences. And then there were also some differences uh, relative to other species that we think may have been driving uh, the distributions. For example, chum and coho also overlapped squid distributions quite a bit, and coho especially overlapped the pteropod uh, distributions, these marine snails, and they ended up in their diets as well. And sockeye distributions tended to uh, match the distribution of euphausids. So uh, we think that perhaps not just temperature, but also prey may be influencing the abundance of fish that we saw out in the ocean. Uh, one of the interesting things is that we caught most of our chum salmon during the day, and we caught most of our coho and, and sockeye at night. So 72% of the chum were caught during the day, but 80 and 92% of the sockeye and coho were caught at night, um, which is really important when you compare our results to the study in 2002 that the uh, Japanese did. So on the far left is a map, and it shows our study grid, and then that line is just where the um, Japanese sampled in 2000 and, uh, 2006. So they just ran the 145 degree uh, longitude line, but they only sampled during the daytime, whereas we were sampling around the clock, day and night. And you can see that they caught a lot of chum salmon, more than certainly proportionally more than we did, but they really didn't catch very many coho or sockeye, which would make sense because they were only sampling during the day, and those we caught more of them at night. Uh, however, they, they actually caught quite a few sockeye, given that they were really only sampling during the daytime. It's also interesting if you look at the latitude of where they sampled versus where we sampled, you can see that the trends in abundance are, are relatively similar given this day night difference. So uh, a lot more chum salmon, especially further south is where it, as well as uh, pinks in, in both studies. Um, the Canadians were out there, like I, I said, in the apparently the late 50s and, and throughout the 60s. And so the black dots are showing uh, these Canadian high seas, winter high seas samples. And this is just length and weight for chum, coho, pinks, and sockeye versus 2009, or excuse me, 2019, which are in red. And it, given kind of the ends, the upper ends of those distributions, it looks like uh, back in the day they were catching larger chum and sockeye salmon than we saw in our study. And, and certainly there's been a declining size of all Pacific salmon across the North Pacific. Uh, which is consistent with this, but it is interesting to see the differences in sizes. And clearly, they were having some issues uh, measuring. I'm not sure if it was the length or weight, the sockeye. I'm not sure why there's so much spread, but wouldn't really expect that. OK, so what were the salmon eating? Um, this graph just shows the uh, percent by weight for uh, the different salmon species. And you can see euphosids in blue were clearly important for uh, all salmon, pteropods in gray, particularly for coho, which is a bit unusual. They, they, they're known to consume uh, pteropods, but that was a lot. We also had a lot of species consuming squid, uh, which makes sense since we're catching a lot of them, and then as well as fish. And most of the fish we saw in the diets were mctophids. And chum were also eating a lot of jellyfish and unidentified material, uh, which is consistent with previous reports. They tend to eat a lot more gelatinous stuff than other species. So really, no, no big surprises there. What was really interesting, though, is that the feeding success, these are fish that are caught together in the same area, um, really varied. 
So if you, on the left is stomach fullness expressed as percent uh, body weight. So this is the stomach contents divided by the weight of the fish. And you can see that both chum and pink salmon have relatively low values, uh, whereas the others are much higher. And on the right are the percent of empty stomachs. And so uh, almost 30, over 35% and over 45% of chum and pink salmon, respectively, had empty stomachs, nothing in them, uh, whereas the other species had much lower levels of empty stomachs. So it's really puzzling, uh, given they're all out there in the same place, more or less, uh, why there were such differences in, in prey that, that they were consuming. Uh, What's really cool that is unique about this study, and certainly occurred in the 2006 study, but the previous work uh, was un unable to do it, and that is use genetics to tell where the fish come from. And this is kind of a summary slide of that. So the chum salmon had the widest, widest origins of any of the salmon. So we were catching chum from Japan, Russia, Alaska, Canada, and Washington. Uh, coho were also widely originating. Uh, from Alaska all the way down to Oregon. In fact, one, two of the fish uh, were identified as Yaquina River coho salmon, which is very cool. Um, we also got a Columbia River and some sockeye, or uh, excuse me, Washington coast fish. Uh, sockeye were mainly from Alaska and Canada, pinks, same Alaska, Canada, and then uh, the Chinook, one was from Alaska, one was from northern Canada, and one was a Snake River fall Chinook, which is also very cool. So our fish are out there. Uh, digging a little deeper into the genetics, this is an analysis that uh, what we call, who we call Hiko-san, who is out on the cruise and, and is a world expert on chum salmon. Uh, this is showing the origins of the different chum salmon. I, I provided a summary uh, on the previous slide. This is now drilling down a little further. And you can see that uh, on the bottom left graph, it has uh, the origins of all fish combined. and we actually caught more Russian and Japanese chum salmon than we did any other single group. And on the right side are the different ocean ages. So ocean age one means it's during its first year in the ocean, two, et cetera. And you can see that the younger fish were originating from British Columbia uh, in green and Alaska in blue. And the pink is, or purple is the Washington fish. Uh, but the older fishes, ocean age threes and fours, are either made up of Western Alaska fish or these Russian and Japanese chum salmon, which I thought was really, really fascinating to see. Uh, as far as sockeye, this is breaking down then the sockeye catch. So about half of the sockeye we caught originated in Bristol Bay, another quarter from other Alaska, and only 8% were from Fraser River. And if you remember in 2019, the return to the Fraser River was the lowest ever. Uh, it was about uh, half a million fish compared to about 55 million returning to the Bristol Bay. Uh, it makes sense that the, the uh, proportions would be as they are. They were the Canadians were obviously hoping to catch a few more Bristol Bay, uh, or excuse me, Fraser River sockeye to help understand what's going on. Uh, one thing that's really interesting too is that when the Russians uh, before they brought the ship over to meet us in Vancouver, they had sampled off Kamchatka, and then they came in and worked with us, and then on their way back, they sampled just kind of every once in a while, and this is the catch of sockeye on these, uh, both off Kamchatka, and then on their return visit, they were getting sockeye, and uh, most of these were Russian, 47%, uh, 40% were Alaskan, again, Bristol Bay, but 13% of them originated from Canada, including the Fraser River. So we now know that the distribution of Fraser River sockeye is actually much broader than anybody had originally thought, um, so which is really cool, very interesting stuff. As far as coho, uh, this is showing the distribution uh, of the different origins of the fish. So purple is the Columbia River, yellow is our, our Yaquina Bay fish, and then the green or Washington coast. So a few of those, but the, definitely the catches were dominated by uh, fish originating from Alaska and BC. And if you break those down, all the Alaska fish are from Southeast Alaska populations. And most of the British Columbia fish are from Northern British Columbia, but also include uh, East Coast of Vancouver Island and the Strait of Georgia, which is in the darkest blue. And then the 
pink color is West Coast Vancouver Island, so some southern. And it, it's interesting, all these, that they're, they're mixed together. Uh, there wasn't clear spatial differentiation across the study area of these different stocks of fish. Uh, one of the really cool things we saw, well, I shouldn't say cool, interesting, uh, was these skinny chum salmon. And this is uh, individual. Uh, it has a CF, which is the condition factor of 0.7, uh, which is the weight divided by the length cubed, um, and which is really, really low. And we were getting a lot of these. This one was actually otolith marked, so Hiko was able to tell exactly where it came from, the shari hatchery in Hokkaido, Japan. Uh, but it's a really skinny fish. And we were getting these skinny guys caught together with the normal uh, chum salmon. So he go kind of dove into this and looked at it. The line there is at 0.9, which is how he's defining skinny fish. And if you look at the origins of these fish that are below that line, that's the condition fisher. Condition factor versus the length on the x-axis. You can see that the ocean age twos and threes are the main ones, not ocean age ones, which is what the uh, critical size, critical period uh, hypothesis would, would say they would be, uh, which was interesting. And then if you look at the origins of those fish that are skinny, uh, the colored parts of these bars are the skinny fish. The white parts are normal uh, fish that have normal condition factor. And you can see that they're from most areas except for western Alaska. Uh, which is interesting. It's not a specific stock that's skinny. It's across across the board, all the stocks, except for these Western Alaska fish that were skinny, uh, which is really, really interesting and, and makes you scratch your head and wonder why, why were they unable to find food out there when other fish were able to find food. Uh, one of the big questions I had for this study was where were all the predators? So uh, we caught two spiny dogfish and a couple dagger tooths, but I thought for sure we'd get a bunch of salmon sharks, maybe a white shark or two. Uh, they just weren't there. The previous research has suggested that few predators have been caught um, in the past in, in other surveys. And we took eDNA samples that Christoph is running. Uh, so it would be really cool to see if we missed the predators. Are they able to get out of the net? Uh, and we never caught them, or were they never there? Uh, so I'm. Uh, really excited to see what the eDNA samples show was out there that, that didn't end up in the net. OK, so moving on to the future. And obviously, I can't tell time very well, because um, I was calling the present 2019 and the future 2020, when we're actually in 2020. But this is a cruise um, that's ongoing right now. They left last week, uh, March 11th, on this ship. Uh, the Pacific Legacy, and this is more Dick Beamish fundraising, and as well as funding from uh, Department of Fish and Oceans and the British Columbia government. And they're doing a similar geographic survey as we did in 2019, but uh, more toes closer to shore, and also some deeper toes. And we also have on this cruise a international uh, crew, scientific crew. So there's both Russians, Americans, and Canadians on board. But I just heard from Dick. Uh, yesterday that uh, as of Tuesday they'd made eight sets and already caught a lot more pink salmon than we did, uh, a lot of chum coho and even one steelhead. So it's really exciting that they're out there. They're doing two week legs uh, and hopefully they'll be able to do both legs. Uh, it won't, second one won't get canceled because of the coronavirus, but it, uh, obviously they're off to a good start as far as catching salmon out there. And then uh, the even further into the future is next winter, 2021, when we're hoping to have at least three ships out uh, during the winter looking at these salmon winter e ecosystems. Uh, so I put in a request to use the NOAA ship Shimada. Uh, the Canadians are going to use the Franklin, which is the replacement for their Ricker. And then the Russians have uh, agreed to bring out at least one ship, if not two. Uh, to do surveys. What we hope to do is have consistent sampling across all vessels. So doing the plankton, uh, CDDs, fishing, all the same, so we can compare results. And I should mention that this is uh, also a really good platform for other studies. Um, I would love to get like a toad plankton recorder, uh, especially marine mammal and bird observations uh, going on board. 
uh, other things that people can think of. We're going to be out there. Uh, you can spend a lot of money to get out there, and, and it'd be nice to, if other people are interested in piggybacking on this, uh, please see me. And we'll do two-week legs. So we're probably going to start in Sitka, Alaska, for our, the US portion of it, um, and then come into Kodiak, and then start the second leg in Kodiak and get off in, in Sitka. Um, and we need volunteers. So I'm compiling a list of people who are interested in going. Uh, and hopefully you have some C experience and know what you might be getting into. So, and with that, oh, uh, after 2021, um, there's some talk of having alternate year surveys, trying to continue this effort. It's a huge, huge effort. The ships are expensive. Uh, processing samples are expensive. Um, I don't think we can do it every year, but certainly in alternate years. But we need to show and convince people uh, that allocate money for ship time, et cetera, that there's value to these cruises. So we need to work on that. Uh, and in conclusion, I think as our oceans are changing, we really need to understand the details of these ocean ecosystems that support commercial species like salmon. Uh, certainly the winter period is the least understood and we need to know more. And winter salmon ocean ecology is really complex. We saw that individuals that were caught together varied in their stomach fullness, their condition, their size, et cetera, as well as uh, they were distributed across our study area in, in different ways. Um, some looked like they were barely surviving the winter, these skinny fish that had nothing in their stomachs, and others were thriving. Uh, and we really don't know why. And the Myers et al. Uh, winter ocean ecology paper were right. It is really complicated. Uh, wasn't really obvious what what was going on. I think too, it's important. You you learn a lot by one year, but you learn even more by having more than one year. And so it'll be really interesting to see the survey that's going on right now and 2021. Uh, are did what we saw in uh, 2019? Was it typical or was it unique to these other surveys? Uh, and we hopefully can begin to relate winter abundances of salmon on the high seas to adult returns. The Russians have been able to do that for pink salmon, and we'd love to be able to do that uh, for West Coast salmon as well. And then finally, I think it's really important to have this international cooperation, uh, and it's really essential if we want to succeed with this. Uh, the fish don't pay any attention to international boundaries, and I think we can all learn from each other that uh, Everybody does it slightly differently, and, and there's a lot to be learned from people with a lot of experience. And before I stop, I just wanted to put a plug in. I saw a great talk at the Oregon American Fisheries Society meeting a couple weeks ago by uh, uh, it was a Dutch fellow uh, promoting World Fish Migration Day. And they have happy fish and love flows, and it was just celebrating how amazing anadromous fish like salmon are, truly are. They go out there, swim thousands of miles in the ocean, thousands of miles in freshwater, and they make it work and have been able to persist and hopefully will continue to persist. So uh, I encourage you to do something for Fish Migration Day, even if it's sitting in your jammies in front of your computer watching a, a YouTube video of a fish swimming upstream. So uh, with that, I will open it up for questions. And if you want more information on our 2019 cruise, uh, the yearthesalmon.org has a great thing. I have yet to find a website for the one that's happening right now, but hopefully there will be one up, coming up soon. So thank you. in comparison to the experience they were um, for their first year in ocean conditions? So Does we'll be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so like relate growth rates over yeah. time. Yeah. And see I, if there was any pattern. Yes. I, it will be really interesting to see uh, what was going on. There's some argument that the fact that it was mainly ocean age twos uh, there's a big odd even cycle because of pink salmon are dominant in odd years and not even years. And that maybe that reflects what was going on, that it was the Ocean H2s because they were had been interacting with pink salmon. 
um, but we really don't know. So it will be interesting this year to see if it's still the Ocean Age 2s that are small or if it's the Ocean Age 1s and 3s that are small. Is it an odd even signal or what? Uh, so yeah, no, and I'm sure HECO is looking at across the otoliths and measuring growth because there is generally believed, and, and Kate Myers always argued this, uh, that the fish growth rates in freshwater before they even go to the ocean influence their ocean growth rates. Uh, throughout their ocean experience. So if you're always slow growing, if you're slow growing in freshwater, you're going to be slow growing out in the ocean, and vice versa. So. Um, I have a question online. Um, was there any casual observations of marine mammals while you were on this particular cruise? Yes. So we saw marine mammals several times. Uh, we saw some really big whales that I don't know if they were fins. I'm not a, we weren't on deck very much um, was part of it. And so it was just very, uh, opportunistic. Uh, we saw some killer whales once. We saw some uh, pod, like four big whales. I don't know if they were blues or fins or something big. Uh, and saw them then uh, like the next day. We we are two days later. We had moved out of that area, gone south, and then turned around and come back. And we we're 60 miles west or east of where we were before when we saw the whales. And we saw another pod of whales. Uh, and we also saw a I don't know, four or five times uh, Pacific white-sided dolphins, but I would love to have a marine mammal observer on board who can have dedicated effort and know, know their whales, because they're, you know, they're kind of off in the distance, and I'm just not good enough at, at looking at the blows and being able to tell you what it is. It's like, that's a big whale. <laughs> so if people are interested, they should contact you. Yes, before. yes. And what is the date of your... So question? we don't have dates uh, for 2021, sometime between... Uh, February 1st and March 31st, I have requested 40 days. And the Canadians will probably also be going out in that same time period. So we can, yeah, if people are interested, especially if you know both marine mammals and birds, uh, we would love to have you come with us. We will, you can eat as much as you want on board. <laughs> um, so what portion of the salmon were hatchery origin? So, um, that's a good question. I do not know. Uh, most, trying to think, uh, I don't know. We certainly got some hatchery fish, both the, like the skinny chum salmon was a hatchery fish. Uh, I know that some of the chum salmon from Japan, they otolith mark their salmon there. And so we know there were hatchery fish. Uh, I believe some of the pink salmon were also hatchery, of a huge hatchery program in Alaska. And then Several of the coho that originated from down here, uh, northwest, were hatchery fish. So we had a couple, the Columbia River fish, one was cowlitz, we had some big creek, uh, et cetera. I don't know what the proportions were. Um, and then there's another question um, related to your mention of the blob. Um, can you talk a little bit about the temperature um, regime that was out there? Do you know if it was normal or typical, or was it that you were sampling? Yeah, so we think that the temperatures were about half a degree above normal. Uh, there's kind of a climb, and I, I had a slide in there and I took it out um, showing the sea surface temperature anomalies. Uh, it was a little bit towards the northern end of the study area. It was probably about half a degree, maybe a degree above average, and towards the southern end it was perhaps half a degree above average. It was definitely warm. And that's one of the things about the 2020 cruise that's going on right now is that temperatures appear to be uh, much more normal. So half a degree and a degree doesn't sound like a lot, but it's huge out in the ocean. So, so it's, it's a lot. So it'd be a inter really interesting comparisons. Yeah. John, did you have a question? Yeah. The, the uh, abundance, obviously, they're very dependent on how much food there is, how much mass there is. There's good years and bad years. But do they actually really compete for food? Is, is their biomass relative to the food out there really high? And do does the high abundance of one fish really matter to the other one? Yeah, so that's actually a really interesting question. And one of the things, ooh, I think I have a slide of it. Yes, uh, is these Chrysaeora. So those blue uh, circles are Chrysaeora melanaster. This is a sea nettle. We get a different species of sea nettle off our coast, and this is a, a different one. And they estimated that. The biomass of the Chrysaeora, especially at night, they come up and we just get obliterated with them. Um, 
that the biomass of this Chrysaeora is about, I think it was 15 times the biomass of all the other fish we caught combined. And based on what we know about the diets of these guys, the, the species that's off our coast, they actually compete with salmon, juvenile salmon. So they eat a lot of the same things, larval fish, uh, they can eat copepods and euphalsids, et cetera. So this Chrysaeora may actually be the big competitor out there. It will be interesting to see. And there's supposed to be a paper coming out uh, describing this, this abundance of Chrysaeora. Chrysaeora is generally also thought to be a more coastal species. And so you can see those blue dots. Uh, some of those are a long ways from shore. So uh, it was really interesting to see how far away from shore we were and still getting tons and tons of Chrysaeora in the net at night. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so each site wasn't sampled one day, one night, you were No, coming. no. We just get to a site, we'd sample it. Uh, so it took about an hour to do the CTD. Um, I can actually show, we got that. Uh, so we put this rosette down um, that had a CTD on the bottom, a conductivity temperature depth profiler. And then when they were taking water samples to look at what our chemistry, we, they'd send this down to either 600 or 1,000 meters. Uh, that took about an hour at every station, and at the same time, uh, we took plankton. So two different nets, either down to 50 or 250 meters, uh, to get those. And uh, what was your question? I lost my train of thought. Um, just whether you were um, purposefully oh. sampling day yes. and night at each site, or yes. it just happened to be when you came on. Yeah, no. So this, this took about an hour to do this, and then we'd put the net in the water for an hour, and then we'd move once the fish net was pulled back on shore, we'd start heading to the next station. Um, how is the depth of the um, fish sampling at that? Could you talk a little bit about possibly being above? Yeah, yeah. So they fish this net close to the surface. You could never see it uh, where, when, we, when it was actually fishing, you couldn't see the net. Like the surface trawls that we do in our juvenile salmon surveys off the coast here, you can actually see the floats on the surface. And it, often you can see the doors riding up occasionally out of the water. This net was just a little bit deeper. I think it was the top of it was probably at about five meters water depth and then down to 30 meters uh, total depth or 35, I guess, would be. And that's being repeated now? Every, yeah. yeah. Well, there, no. So that was what, this is the standard, the way they fish the net is the standard way the Russians do it when they're sampling for pink salmon on off of the Camp Chat Cut. So we kind of use their protocol. What they're doing right now in 2020 um, is doing oblique toes. So you set it and you start at the surface and you drop it down and then go up. I think that's what they're doing. Or they could be, and I, I don't know, it would be interesting to see. The other thing um, that Dick, Dick Beamish likes to do is that he'll sample one toe will be at the surface, the next station you're kind of midwater, and then the third one is deep. And just like right below where the net would have been on the previous toes. Um, so I don't know what they're doing, but they're, they're mixing it up. A little bit more. The fact that they got a steelhead means that at least part of the time it was right at the surface because steelhead are very, very surface oriented. We think they're within the top meter uh, of the surface. Yeah. Um, any other questions online? John, do you have any other questions? Not online. <laughs> <laughs> John's stuck in the room. <laughs> All right. I think that is everybody. Um, I'm getting clap, clap, clap uh, on the, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us. If you have any questions or if you'd like to volunteer, yeah. please reach out to Lauren specifically and um, I'll keep us all informed on when we can start seminars again. Um, but for now, uh, go back and check out any seminars you might have missed on the HMSC website under Visit Hatfield. Um, there's a place there for our past seminars. And thank you everybody. I'll be ending the presentation shortly. Thanks. Excellent. So the question that I had was, I guess, um, do the salmon compete? Yeah. And that for food, and that if your salmon Chrysiora is 15 to 1, it's like, well, that's really bad, obviously. Yeah. We don't but know. If, yeah. So, so uh, they were gonna... though, if they get to be at a low enough density, maybe it's not competition at all. Maybe it's yeah. everybody for themselves. You know, uh, when we brought up the plankton nets, I mean, down to 200 meters, 
And I wanted to get, David Jacob, uh, Jacobson had asked me to bring home some uh, Cocoa Pots for him. And he's like, oh yeah, just like a, you know, a teaspoonful or whatever. And I went to go ask the guy, you know, Evgeny, when he brought the nets up, he was like, hey, can, can I get some? And he's like, that's all we have. Oh. Oh my God. So it's winter. I mean, the water was so clear. It was unbelievable. So salmon are unbelievably good at visual predation, but yeah. It's still yeah, yeah, to anything. Yeah. So Evgeny and Brian, uh, Brian, whatever his last name is, uh, are putting together a food web. So they're using stabilized hopes and trophic biomarkers, uh, fatty acids, to assemble a food web out there. So it's we can have, I don't know. And the speed. in production or something yeah. relative to growth of the fish and where yeah. the numbers are. Yeah, no, and how does it how does it vary, you know, spatially, yeah. uh, et cetera. Because clearly with a Chrysler you're in the northern part of the steady area and not in the south. That was a that was a big sucking noise. So yeah. it's a very interesting. Right. Excellent. Well, Thank I wouldn't you have attended you. except that the university is doing some nasty thing to my computer uh -oh. and it's gonna get fixed.